2,161 days. That's how long the React team has been preparing for this release. Why did it take so long, and was it worth the wait? To better answer these questions, we need to go back. The year was 2016. It was a simpler time. Harambe was alive, the world was united in catching virtual Pokemon, and the React team had one goal. Make React, and therefore millions of websites, more performant. The biggest hindrance to this didn't necessarily have to do with React itself, but with the language that React was built on, JavaScript, and how JavaScript worked in the browser. In a nutshell, the browser handles all of your JavaScript, user events, renders, paints, layouts, and reflows, all in a single main thread. This is usually fine, but if you're not careful, it can cause issues. So today, React is synchronous, which means when you update a component, React is going to synchronously process that update. It's going to do all of the work to finish the update in a single, uninterrupted block on the main thread, right? So the problem, of course, is that if the user uh, is that user events also fire on the main thread. So if you're chugging along, rendering an update, and in the meantime, the user tries to type into an input, in synchronous React, that input event can't be processed until after the currently executing render has completed, so like all the way past the blue, right? So what was the solution? Well, if blocking the main thread is a problem, can't we just do all of the work inside of another thread using a web worker? Yes, but actually no. React didn't need a way to offload work onto another thread. What React needed was a way to make the current work it already does a little more flexible. Now let's take a closer look at what we have here. What we have is some I.O. work followed by some CPU work. And we've seen this pattern before. We should ideally be able to do some of that in parallel. Because this is not a performance problem. This is fundamentally a scheduling problem. What the React team figured out was if they could somehow enhance React to be able to both differentiate between low priority work, like rendering a list, and high priority work, like user input or animations, as well as give React the ability to jump between these tasks, then theoretically, the experience of every React app would improve since React would always prioritize the most important work first. So this is what they did, and they named it React Fiber. It seemed to us that scheduling is a core primitive of UI engineering. We just have to deal with it in very ad hoc ways right now. And that's why we investigated and experimented with a lot of different models, like based on uh, threads and workers and built-in primitives. And everything has trade-offs. And finally, we settle on a model that we think will change the trajectory of how we build the UIs. And that's why we built React Fiber, a complete reimplementation of the core algorithm inside of React with ground-up support for built-in scheduling. Sebastian went on to explain that even though it was a fundamental change to React itself, Fiber wasn't designed as a new framework, and instead would launch as part of the next major version of React, version 16, and it would come with the ability to opt into async interruptible rendering. Now, this is when the story gets a little bit hard to follow. We'll try and keep up. Remember, we're still in early 2017 here. At this point, React was objectively smarter with the ability to prioritize work and interrupt rendering. But that was really only half the picture. The other, arguably more difficult half, was figuring out a public API that allowed React developers to consume these features in a way that wasn't completely destructive to the entire React ecosystem. The first step in solving this was getting rid of the parts of React that worked against this new async interruptible rendering. Specifically, component will mount, component will receive props, and component will update, which all went on to receive their API versions of the dunce camp in React 16.3. That same version also gave us the new context API, and a month later, we got another preview of what the React team was now calling async rendering. The, the main problem here is not the performance, but scheduling. And the solution has to think about the scheduling. And so we call this uh, see the features async rendering in React. And our goal is to let app developers adapt to users' constraints, such as device and network, to make fast interactions feel instant without the janky uh, things popping out of the screen, and uh, make slower interactions feel responsive and be designed intentionally. The problem, as Dan went on to explain years later, was there was still something missing from React to make using these new scheduling features more consumable. That something was hooks. Hooks were released in React Comp in October of 2018, and they were the biggest change to React since it was released. The initial focus of hooks were that they allowed you to use functions instead of classes for creating React components. However, in reality, they were so much more than that. With hooks, you got better code reuse, improved composition, and more reasonable defaults. And not often talked about, hooks were designed in part to help developers naturally write code 
that was more compatible with async rendering. At this same conference, we also got another update on async rendering, now rebranded as Concurrent React. So we've, we think we have a, a way to address this type of problem, and it's called Concurrent React. Now, if you're confused because you've heard of something called Async React before, um, we had a naming workshop, and we decided that the, the term async is a very broad term that describes many things. Uh, and while Concurrent React does, in fact, encompass many capabilities, we think the word uh, concurrent properly emphasizes the part that makes it special. So let me explain what I mean when I say concurrent. So Concurrent React can work on multiple tasks at a time and switch between them uh, using cooperative multitasking according to their priority. Concurrent React can also do something else. It can partially render a tree without committing the result uh, to the DOM. Uh, so for example, React can start rendering an update. And if it hits a component that hasn't finished loading, for instance, React can wait for it to complete before it continues. Uh, and it doesn't immediately have to show a fallback or a spinner or a placeholder or nothing, right? Um, and also, Concurrent React, crucially, it does not block the main thread. This was a nice recap, but once again, there were no actionable updates. Then, a year later at React Comp 2019, we finally got something we could download, this time rebranded as Concurrent Mode. Techniques like selective hydration and the full set of suspense features are made possible by Concurrent Mode. Concurrent mode enables React apps to be more responsive by giving React the ability to interrupt large blocks of lower priority work in order to focus on something that's higher priority, like responding to a user input. <laughs> concurrent mode is now available in our experimental channel. It includes all of our concurrent features. Our goal is to enable sharing of knowledge and cross-pollinate ideas before the APIs are finalized. Finally, over three years since the start of this journey, users had something that they could experiment with. Was it the final API? No. Was it ready for production? Also no, but it was something. The idea behind concurrent mode was that you would be able to turn it on for your entire app and therefore see the performance benefits of concurrent rendering just by upgrading. In reality, it didn't really pan out quite like that. The problem with an all or nothing upgrade strategy is that it's just not realistic for large applications. It was clear that this strategy needed an incremental story. React 17 was the first step to address this. Released a year later in August of 2020, React 17 allowed you to run multiple versions of React in the same application. The idea was that this would help incremental adoption since you could upgrade parts of your application to React 18 and therefore get the concurrent rendering benefits while parts that weren't able to upgrade could remain on React 17. In short, this didn't really work, in part because it also didn't give enough granular control over upgrading. Now, there was another mode called blocking mode, which was sort of a hybrid between the old legacy mode and the new concurrent mode. Let's just say it also didn't work for reasons related to how you probably feel looking at this chart right now. So one last time, the React team went back to the drawing board with a new focus on improving the incremental adoption story of these concurrent features. Then, a year later, and over five years from the very first PR, it was finally here with one final rebrand. After hearing your feedback, we're excited to share that concurrent mode is nowhere to be found in React 18. It's replaced by our gradual adoption strategy where you can adopt concurrent rendering at your own pace. The way this works is that now, by using any of the concurrent features, you're essentially telling React that you want to opt into concurrent rendering for this particular part of your application. So finally, now with all of the context, what exactly are those concurrent features? Well, remember, if one of the main goals of this entire process was the ability to prioritize work and interrupt rendering, it would make sense that we'd get an API for doing just that. That's where use deferred value can help us out. You can think of use deferred value as a way to tell React to defer updating a value until all of its high priority rendering work is finished. Why is that helpful? Well, it helps you give visual feedback to the user by deferring the re-rendering of expensive, non-urgent components. So take this scenario, for example. Say you had an input field whose value was hooked up to some state which triggered the render of an expensive list component. Historically, React would treat updating the input field with the exact same priority as updating the list. Oftentimes, this meant the value, and therefore the UI of the input field, would lag behind what the user actually typed since React was too busy rendering the expensive list component to notice. Instead, what we want is for React to always prioritize updating the input field, and then, when it's finished, re-render the expensive component with the new value. This is the exact problem that use deferred value solves. Since use deferred value lets you defer updating a value until all the high priority rendering work is finished, it allows us to delay giving the expensive list component the new input value until React has the resources to render it. 
Similar in nature is the new Start Transition API. However, instead of delaying the update of a value, Start Transition lets you explicitly tell React which updates are lower priority. The way it does this is when any updates are wrapped inside of a Start Transition, React will treat that update with a lower priority and will interrupt it if a higher priority update like user events happen. Next, and a word you've probably heard a lot over the years, is suspense. The whole goal of suspense is to make reading data over the network as easy as using props or state. In practice, suspense is just a React component that lets you declaratively specify the loading UI for any part of the component tree if it's not yet ready to be displayed. Why is that helpful? Well, it allows a user experience like this to be upgraded to a user experience like this. And on the developer side, it allows code that looks like this to be refactored to look like this. By decoupling and reading the data from the loading UI that's shown to the user, you make the loading UI a first-class concern that better aligns with React's programming model. So at this point, we've talked a lot about prioritizing work and interrupting rendering, but there is one feature in React 18 that's unrelated to that, and it's a new hook called UseID. UseID is used to generate unique IDs. Now your first reaction to that might be to use it for something like this, specifically to create unique IDs for mapping. That's not a good idea. Instead, it's used to build more accessible forms and will probably be a lower level feature geared towards component libraries. In fact, you may have noticed that it feels like almost all of these features are low level. That's kind of by design. Even the official release mentions that in most cases, you won't interact with concurrent APIs directly. That's what makes it so difficult to judge if React 18 was revolutionary or if it just made React faster in use cases that no one had. Regardless, it was a huge, long-awaited milestone and all React developers are better off for it even if it's not quite clear how yet.